when someone does something wrong, the person who did it responsible, or the person who did it is responsible, right? Would it ever be right, though, to hold the descendants of that person, say their children, responsible as well? What about their grandchildren or great-grandchildren? Would it ever be fair for responsibility for harm to cross generational lines? This morning, I'd like to explore these questions in relation to our lectionary text from 1 Samuel 3. As a whole, I think as we saw, it seeks to establish that Samuel is a trustworthy prophet. To refresh our memory, Samuel has been serving under the priest Eli, and our text recounts Samuel's call, which includes God's disclosure of what's coming for Eli's house. And as we heard, the message Samuel gets is not good news for Eli. God says that Eli's house or family will be judged forever, and no sacrifice will ever remove their guilt. Ouch. I'm not sure why, but I can't help but lean into challenging parts of a lectionary text like this rather than the safe stuff like Samuel's call, which comes with its own ready-made hymn of response. Here I am, Lord. No, we won't go there. Instead, I'd like to bring the way our lectionary text construes responsibility for wrongdoing as something that can cross generations into conversation with racism and colonialism. To get there, rather than here I am, Lord, I'd like to start with some Bob Dylan. In 1963, which was the year this church held its first service, Bob Dylan recorded a song called Who Killed Davy Moore? According to Wikipedia, which I hope is trustworthy here, Davy Moore was a boxer who died from injuries in a match. While Moore was able to give an interview after the match, he fell unconscious shortly thereafter and died a few days later. So, who killed Davy Moore? Let's listen to a few verses. You want to hear that? Who killed Davy Moore? Why and what's the reason for? Not I, said the referee. Don't point your finger at me. I could have stopped it in the eighth and kept him from his deadly feet. But the crowd would have booed, I'm sure, at not getting their money's worth. It's too bad he had to go, but there was pressure on me, too, you know. It wasn't me that made him fall. You can't blame me at all. Who killed Davy Moore? Why? What's the reason for? Not us, said the angry crowd, whose voices filled the arena loud. It's too bad he died that night, but we'd just like to see a fight. We'd just like to see some sweat. There ain't nothing wrong in that. It wasn't us that made him fall. You can't blame us at all. Who killed Davy Moore? Why and what's the reason for? And so it goes, round and round. There's more to it. The referee says, not me, the crowd, not us, the manager, not I, and even the gambler who bet that Davy Moore would win says, not me. The other boxer in Dylan's song will even go on to say, no, not I either. He'll concede, I hit him, yes, it's true, but then explains, but that's what I'm paid to do. Don't say murder, don't say kill, it was destiny, it was God's will. And so after each party denies responsibility, the song concludes with the refrain, who killed Davy Moore, why, and what's the reason for? I think Dylan's songs suggest that it's not just the person who threw the punches 
that's responsible. Instead, responsibility for harm can involve a broader and more complex web that entangles others as well. Those who contributed to the conditions in which Moore's death occurred also seem responsible for that death in Dylan's song. With this idea in mind, I'd like to return to our lectionary text, beginning with the reason the text gives for the judgment against Eli's house or family that will extend forever, implying that it extends beyond just Eli and his sons. According to verse 13, the reason is that Eli knew of the iniquity of his sons and that he failed to restrain them. The word is more typically used to describe something decreasing, like eyesight as one ages, or the appearance of a disease as it lessens or abates. So we might think about Eli's offense here as not lessening wrongdoing or harm. I think this larger textual context will also help clarify the nature of Eli's wrong. In 1 Samuel 2, Eli did judge his son's behavior as wicked and said that what he's heard about them is not good. But his sons refused to listen. It should be acknowledged that the reason his sons didn't listen was that it was the will of the Lord to kill them. That's to quote verse 25. This opens its own can of theological worms that I won't try to address this morning. But I think this context puts Eli's wrong into starker relief. He knew about iniquity. He spoke to those involved, but he did not lessen the harm. And for this text, lessening harm matters. Our lectionary text also doesn't tell the entire story about Eli's sons. It describes their offense in general terms as iniquity or blasphemy. The backstory involves some complicated details about sacrifice. And while it depends on the type of sacrifice, normally when a person brought an animal to a priest to sacrifice it, they would get a certain prescribed portion, as would the priest, at least according to Leviticus. But 1 Samuel 2 suggests something else was going on. When a person brought an animal for sacrifice, the priest's servant was taking a three-pronged fork, sticking it into the pots, and the priest would take whatever stuck. So what appears wrong here is that they are taking more, or other than, their share. Doing so would deprive others of what should be theirs. We might imagine this as a sort of unjust or improper gain at the expense of others. I think this context helps illumine why our lectionary thinks that it is right to hold future generations of Eli's family responsible for the sins of Eli and his sons. Perhaps our text assumes it is right because the unjust gains of Eli and his sons could have implications for the standing of groups in future generations. So, even if subsequent generations of Eli's house might not have created an unjust system that benefits them or done anything themselves to harm others, when the benefit from harm crosses generational lines, so too does the responsibility for it. I wonder whether this way of thinking could help us address some of our own social realities. For instance, in a 2020 article from the Brookings Institute, Rashawn Ray and Andre Perry open with a statistic that, here I quote, an average white family has roughly 10 times the amount of wealth as the average black family. Contributing factors to this situation and their analysis include things like wealth disparities that emerged under slavery and that grew through racist practices like redlining. 
In other words, an unjust gain among one group of people at the expense of others in a generation contributes to social and economic disparities for those groups in subsequent generations, especially as the iniquities compound over time. Thus, Ray and Perry will ultimately argue in favor of reparations to try to make things right in the present generation. Seems to me that this sort of argument in favor of reparations has striking resonance with the way our lectionary text rationalizes the cross-generational judgment against Eli's family. When the benefit from harm crosses generational lines, so too does the responsibility for it. In earlier phases of my life, I would have been inclined to dismiss these sort of ideas. Indeed, other portions of the Bible, like Ezekiel, are explicitly critical of them. But these days, I think ideas like what we find in Samuel might provide a sort of framework or rationale for responding to iniquities today that have roots in practices of and systems established in former generations. In addition to racism, I think of things like colonialism involving the killing and displacement of indigenous people from their lands with ideas like the doctrine of discovery. Again, an inequality that emerged between groups in one generation continues to have effects in later ones, especially when sustained by other practices. It's for this reason that groups like the Coalition to Dismantle the Doctrine of Discovery will encourage congregations or individuals to consider things like devoting budget funds to restore lands to indigenous people. When the benefit from harm crosses generational lines, so too does the responsibility for it. And so I wonder, as I wrestle with our lectionary text and the way it construes responsibility for wrongdoing as something that can cross generations, I wonder, could it compel us to work to undo the harms of our own things like racism and colonialism? Here we might also recall how the text perceives Eli's basic fault. It was failing to lessen harm. It's an idea that reminds me of arguments I've heard in the little I've learned about racial justice movements. Many argue, for instance, that it's not enough to not be racist. One must strive to become anti-racist, to undo and resist racism, actively intervening to lessen the harm is what matters. I know I find these ideas challenging. I also know I have much to learn. And I know there is much within me in need of transformation in relation to these complex matters. I wonder what you find helpful or not in bringing our lectionary text into dialogue with these sort of realities. I hope that we'll have occasion to talk further, whether after the service or over beverages later in the week about it. I look forward to journeying with you all as we seek to follow Jesus in welcoming all. Amen.